before we wind up. Um, so today, today I'm very happy uh, to welcome Neela Man Singh Charutari to our MUST. As most of you know, uh, she is one of the leading theatre persons uh, now in India. Uh, we have been seeing her productions for the last very many, many years. Uh, as you know, she is a product of National School of Drama. She has been trained under al uh, But one uh, good thing is that you know, after graduating from al she moved to Bharat Bhavan. Uh, and she worked with Vivi Karanth, uh, who does theatre in a very diametrically opposite uh, way to that of al So she has... Uh, the training from uh, both uh, the two uh, schools of theatre, I would like to say like that, of the Algasian school and uh, Bibi Karan, the style of doing theatre. And seeing her productions, we could uh, see that you know, she has assimilated the best of these two schools and created her own uh, kind of uh, theatre and uh, working methodology. Uh, but another thing is that you know, she is renewing herself uh, with the changing in times. You know, she has developed her own working methodology, I process, which her students tell me that, no, it's wonderful to be working with uh, Neelam. Uh, it's not just a product. The process and uh, the way she makes people uh, to address themselves when they're performing a story, we, how can it get related to the time uh, themselves, personal, uh, as a person, as a social being, everything is there. So she connects with the individual experiences, the social experiences, the history of theatre, mm -hmm. the performance language, and uh, she's one of the most updated theatre persons, I could uh, say that. Uh, uh, that is evident from her practice. And I've been lucky to see many of her productions, uh, including Suit, uh, Kitchen Katha, and my all-time favorite, uh, I have told her many times, Nagamandala, which I would love to see again and again. Uh, this is not just the best Nagamandala I have seen, uh, but it's one of the best plays uh, I have ever seen in my life. So I keep, uh, I don't keep that yeah, secret anymore. I have already told her. I want to, bring, I wanted to bring it to Kerala again, but uh, uh, she couldn't make it. She came with other productions. But it's always uh, nice to have uh, uh, Neelaman Singh with us. Talk to her. She's very warm, uh, very clear and uh, sharp. So I think everybody will have a nice time with her. And uh, she'll be today talking about uh, the process and the production. We just see the production of a play, but what's the process and how the process uh, gets reflected? I don't know what uh, areas of the, those things. For her, it's a big, big thing. And she'll be using her personal experiences general things, theoretical experiences, all these things. So we leave to Neelam Mansingji and please uh, mute your mics and uh, hear and uh, you can, after she talks for some time, uh, we can put our uh, questions and we can start a discussion. Questions, comments, interactions, we can take the subject forward and uh, we can continue it and uh, as an interaction. And uh, so, Nilaman Singh Ji, can we uh, hand it over to you? We are, you are, unmute your mic, unmute your mic. You have to unmute your mic and talk. No, 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 not still. You have to unmute your mic and then talk, Nilaman Singh Ji. Your mic is off. No, 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 it's switched off. No. Your sound uh, is not coming, your sound is muted. You can use your space bar to unmute. Milamji. That's a red. Space bar. Red. Called her or phone? No, no, she has gone for her son. I think he will do it right now.
give a call, sir. Hmm. Other people. Uh, calling someone uh, to get it right. Just wait a minute. You can press the uh, space bar. It will unmute there, temporarily. So there, can you operate the unmute side? Oh no, I am but, trying to unmute her, but it is. Uh, yes, cannot run it from here. Can you just call her? Uh, she is calling. Yeah. She is on phone, talking to somebody. Not sure. Maybe her son has gone out. But Chandra, you would have the um, controls because you no, are no, the no. host. You can no, also no. unmute. The host is Sudhir Babu. He, uh, Sudhir, uh, can you do that? You can yeah, I cannot unmute. I don't know why. I, I am trying for the past five minutes. Ah, then now it now it comes back. Yes. Oh yes, right, right, right. Yeah, You're yeah. right. Yeah. Now? Fine. Talk now. Is it okay now? Oh, it's okay now. It's okay now. Yes, you can carry on. Sorry about this, but I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, as they say. Um, the topic which was uh, suggested by Chandra was uh, process and production. Now process and production is a topic which is very intangible. The way we work doesn't seem to have any definitive uh, formula or system. Um, but I'm sure that despite feeling that I have no system, there must be a system by which I work, maybe an unconscious one. Um, I have been running a theatre company for the last 32 years now, which is very boringly called The Company, um, which, which is a group of people that come from two different worlds. There are the Nakals, which are traditional performers, but tradition in, in, in Punjab cannot be perceived or understood in a similar way to how you would perceive uh, tradition in Kerala, where there's a kind of continuous uh, growth of a tradition. Because of the division of Punjab, there were many truncated uh, um, versions of what existed that one could dip into, um, but they were completely catering to what we would call the more populist, the more, um, uh, the more, um, you know, they could work with the drama division, uh, song and drama division, because they had certain skills, skills of dancing, skill of singing, skill of play, playing musical instruments, of being female impersonators. So all those skills were used for wherever they could get their rosy roti. It could be to sell a pesticide. So you have the actor, you know, like Hanuman getting the Sanjeevni booty, comes with a box of pesticide and says, just use this uh, for better crops. Or it could also be uh, to demolish a political party. They were hired by rival uh, opposition political uh, bodies at that time. So anywhere where they could get work was all right and their skills could be put into use. So in that way, I did not have access to what you would call a definitive, evolved, a classical tradition of the group that I worked with, which is called the Nakals. On the other hand, there were urban actors who came from a certain kind of uh, drama department uh, uh, training. Uh, you know what, Chandra, has, uh, Chan Chandra, can you hear me? Chandra, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes, I'm, I'm hearing it, you. I find it very distracting to see so many faces. I don't know where to focus. Is it <laughs> possible to, I don't know how it's done, but there's so many faces, I don't know whether to look there or whether to look somewhere else. You can. So you I, can. I, I'll try, I'll try. I okay, suppose that is, that, is the, that is the visuals before me. So I'm just finding it a little uh, distracting, but nevertheless, I'll continue. 
And I work with a group of actors who are urban, trained in drama departments or to the local theatre companies that uh, are prolific in Chandigarh. So this combination of working with actors who were certain, who were skilled and had a memory of the tradition that they came from and the uh, urban actors. So this combination became for me the vocabulary through which I worked. Nothing was pre-planned, nothing was um, uh, mapped, but it was basically a kind of um, a kind of equation that I tried to build up. That when two groups of people coming from two different social, economic, uh, educational background, when they come together, what kind of theater can be made through this interaction? Um, so somewhere, my group is a precarious, unstable meeting of the urban and the rural, and even the equation that I set up between genders. Because most of the, most of the folk performers are not only trained in how to sing and how to dance and how to play different musical instruments, but also what it means to transform themselves into a female impersonator. Now, here I would like to just interrupt and say that the transformation of becoming uh, a, a male, uh, a, from a male to a female on the stage did not have the mystical hues that you would see in a Kuriyatam performance or a Kathakali or a Ornagatha from the Kabuki theater. It was more uh, what you would call matter of fact. It was more slapdash. They put powder on their face and made their face into a canvas. On top of it, they painted the brows and the lips and uh, the rouge. The hankies uh, rolled up, became the breast, which were thrust into their bra. But the moment you entered into the green room while they were going through this process of change, they quickly put their hands across their breast. So somewhere, despite not having a codified a system of gender transformation, they had set some internal um, uh, uh, processes in motion that made them feel that they were actually becoming women. So to me, that dimension of working with the uh, Nakals became very significant because I started questioning what does it mean to be how do you construct a man on the stage? What is femininity? What is masculinity? Do I see it performatively? Or do I see it in terms of gender stereotypical role playing? So that became conceptually something that I was continuously evolving, debating, dissecting, analyzing, investigating. Um, uh, now, for ex you know, uh, for the last, 30 years of work, I've done classical texts like Yarma, Nagamandala, Federic, uh, you know, Racine, uh, Fedra of Racine, Mad Woman of Shayo. So I have worked a lot with classical, what you would call the well-made play, with a beginning, middle and an end, where a scripts would be distributed, where movements would be choreographed, where lines would be learned. But even within that, I realized that I had, I had the impulse not to see the play as it was written, but as I would see it performatively. So the switch from the literary to the performative tradition became very essential uh, dimensions that I was exploring. Even within that, I was tossing it around, putting the beginning in the middle, the middle in the end, uh, uh, you know, dovetailing three scenes into one scene, uh, creating long dialogues into lyrics. So even then I had a tendency to, to uh, not take the text as sacrosanct, that the written word is written on stone. I felt that the moment a, 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 a text comes into the public space, it then belongs to the director. Because as we all know, that no two directors deal with the play in the same way. Everyone brings their own social, political, aesthetic consciousness 
into way into the way they structure the performance, into the way they deal with the characters, into the way they deal with the images, the objects, the scenography. So, so um, having said that, since the last six, seven years, I started feeling that a written text was not suited to what I was searching for. Because somewhere I had to feel I was going to challenge myself. So pre-existing text, even when I dealt with it, I was dealing with it in a manner where I tossed and twisted it around. Because linearity, beginning, middle and end, was not suited to perhaps my own way of looking at my creative journey. Uh, so for me, every text became circular. It became... Uh, and I think a lot of that feeling also came to come back to my working with the Nakals, which is the traditional musicians that I worked with. The word Nakal means to imitate. It's a Persian word. When I started following them and started trying to understand and get into their world, I saw to my... I, I experienced that they had certain tools and certain ways of working, which were so sophisticated in the sense that when I saw a production that they did, which was called Sohini Mehwal, a, a Sufi love legend, uh, you know, Sohini uh, looks at another character and says, who are you? And she says, I'm the earthen pot. Because if anybody who's not familiar with the legend of Sohini Mehwal. Uh, she's in love with Mehwal, who lives in the, uh, across the river Chanab. She goes to meet him at night and she comes from a potter's family and she gets a pot from her father's. She's also a potter. So she takes a pot and she uh, swims across the river on that pot or sits on the pot and swims across the river. So, uh, to come back to what I was saying, um, the pot is um, uh, a character. The pot animates itself and says, I am the pot on which you have to travel to meet your lover. And she said, oh, so you're the pot. Uh, uh, she said, but you know, I'm very half-baked. There's a whole plot against you that the pot is going to be half-baked and you don't know how to swim. So you know what's going to happen when you cross the river. So, so he says, well, you know, uh, this is the way the playwright wanted the play to end, that I should drown and I should crumble and I, I should die. So let's go for it. Which means that it was so, in a certain way, like the Greek chorus comes and says the king has to die. You know, it's like the ending is already inbuilt in the whole narrative. I found these tools very fascinating. That where an where a object is also a character. How do you deal with objects on the stage? In the same way, like in the middle of a, a scene when the lover is coming to tell his girlfriend, his beloved, that the father has died, he comes in a horse. The character just has a shawl on his body and he's kind of galloping with this guy miming, uh, you know, what they do in folk theatre, miming that the uh, horse steps. And uh, he's, because nothing is dialogued, it is all sung in verse. So he sings that, um, you know, your, your father is dead and I've come to give you, like a dirge. He sings the dirge. Suddenly the horse throws back his shawl and starts singing with him. It was a grammar completely available to the audience. They didn't find anything odd in this kind of vocabulary of performance. And to see thousands of people sitting under the starlit night, uh, listening to and uh, experiencing a performance which broke all the rules of realism, one could see that something very precious and meaningful had been exchanged. And that became, for me, a real act of wonderment. Because I was used to theatre of the 80s, where you sat in a proscenium, not acknowledging the presence of the man or the woman sitting next to you. The, the, that was the space that belonged to the actors. This was my space. Nobody invaded each other's space. Suddenly to see all those um, uh, formulas being blown to smithereens certainly altered the way I looked at the stage and looked at the performance. Would you like me to continue? 
or would you like to ask a question? Yes, continue. Sorry? I can't hear you. You can continue, continue. So I would say that at this moment, the work that is best suited to what I'm doing, and even previously it existed, but now it has become my training, uh, uh, training alphabets, you can say, which is improvisation. I find improvisation the way uh, I can make the actors as co-authors in the production that I'm putting together. Now, how does this improvisation work? I go into a rehearsal space and the actors are saying, Konsa play kar rahe hai, what is going to happen? I have no idea. I said, I'm as blank as you are. You have come to me with a certain element of trust. But let's go on a journey together. I have no roadmap. I have no high plan. I have certain ideas. Let's see how those ideas can be made manifest, can be concretized, can be made into physical um, tools of the work that we do. Like for example, the last play I did was Gumhe. It is based on, a, it's not that I don't have any stories in my head. I do have some reading material, but the reading material is really the starting point. It becomes the initial, uh, initial um, uh, conversation that I have with my actors. So I had this text which is written by a Aboriginal writer uh, from Australia, which is called The Seven Stages of Grieving, which is really testimonies of what happened to the Aboriginals. You know, it's a, but what I liked in it was that it was even the deepest pain, even when they talk about death, even when they talk about uh, something catalytic, there's an element of irony, there's an element of, uh, of humor. But by humor, I don't mean comedy. I mean, there's a lightness of touch. So there were certain things that really worked for me in that text. And also I was going through a personal tragedy. So whatever you gravitate towards, also depends upon your state of mind and how your state of mind from the individual becomes part of the collective. So I gravitated towards seven stages of grieving because I was grieving in terms of a personal loss that I had experienced. And within that, I found elements of protest. So I would tell the actors, what does protest mean to you? What does loss mean to you? What does home mean to you? You know, all very abstract things. And you have this text, but just use maybe one line of the text. Just use a moment or a word in the text that has a resonance in your being. And then what the actors do sometimes is far removed from what I had imagined. Sometimes it's a fully realized idea that they present. And sometimes it's nothing. You know, it just dissolves into fluff. But it's a journey that we all take together. And I feel that in this way, it becomes a very democratic space where the actors become as much participants in the development of the narrative and the development of the play as the director. But that doesn't mean that our functions are the same. Our functions are completely different. I'm in a position where I chisel, hammer, falter, reject. I, I always tell my actors, I don't really know what I want or what I'm looking for, but I do know what I do not want. Now to come to the question of want, I used a wrong word, even though I used want because I couldn't find another term to structure my sentence. But I find the word want slightly problematic. It seems to feel that the actor is needy and the director is needy. You know, uh, when the actor say, Madam, uh, it seems there is something imbalanced in that kind of dialogue. It's basically 
making the actors more accountable, more responsible, trying to tap their imagination in ways which they never thought is possible. It is all a question of getting away from the stereotypical, the cliché written. So what I do is, I try to find alternative spaces. I tell them, okay, let's have a, let's do a rape scene in a trolley, which I did in Simbo in supermarket. Or sometimes I tell them, um, let's do a love scene under the table. Or let's cook a meal in a bathtub. So by changing the space, which makes no logic, to the context of the scene, I have somewhere allowed them the possibility of exploring that imagination that perhaps may not have uh, manifested itself in a more conventional space. So one is constantly searching for that which is different, which is unusual, not only to be different or unusual, that's not the point. The point is, as T.S. Eliot said, the purpose is not novelty. The purpose is how best we can transform the tradition that we have inherited. How best to transform that. So there are many tools like this that I try to explore with my actors. And let me tell you, let me tell all of you that we might imagine that this type of working is fear. It really isn't. It's more problematic because you have no star, you have nothing to hold on to. You don't have a script that you can hold on to. You don't have a climax that you can move towards. You don't have the beginning of the whole, uh, how you begin a play. Like if you do um, a play like Yarma or even Naga Mandala, which is very close to my heart, which I, because I did that three times. Um, when you do a play like Naga Mandala, you know that how it starts. There's something, there's a hinge on which you can peg something. But here you have nothing. You just have an imagination and a vast, vast emptiness. But in a certain way, that vast emptiness also makes you realize the potentiality and the immense possibilities that can happen on stage. Anything is possible. You know, we always feel that um, theatre has its limitations because it's this much by this much space and it's, uh, you know, ev everything is false on stage. When you open a window in a Chekhov play and you say, oh, how beautiful the cherry tree is. There's no cherry tree. All you're looking at is buckets and, and uh, pochas. Or when you are uh, having a cup of tea and the tea is nothing, it's just water. So everything is false on the stage. But sometimes, and we are seeking for the truth. But sometimes within that falseness, the truth that happens on stage is sometimes more powerful than the truth that we experience in life. And that is why it is beautifully, uh, 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 you know, the beautiful words like Maya, Leela, Ram Leela. You know, it is manif it is contained in that words, that even though everything is a Leela, everything is Maya, but within that, our search for the truth, we can be more honest on the stage than sometimes we can be in life. Because we cannot, you know, uh, being on the stage is like each member of the audience has a magnifying glass in their eyes, where they see, where they can pick up that falseness, where they can smell that falseness. Would you like to ask me a question? You want to? I want to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. So I want to begin uh, from the uh, personal dilemma and then uh, would like to know as to uh, what your take is on the same. So uh, in usually almost all the drama schools, the, you know, um, the basic criticism that most of us receive as a performer is the monotony in the performance that you know you did the same in the last play and you're doing just the same in this play so what is versatile about you so at one point it starts uh, affecting you uh, but then once you start thinking about it uh, I believe it goes to the uh, 
the main um, you know saying that an artist has to reinvent reinvent himself or herself on a regular basis you have to question your art so uh, the problem basically arises when you realize that you have reached a point wherein you have gone back to your level of comfort wherein you learn so much you know such and such skills you know we learn color we learn different forms of martial arts but there is a tendency in at least in me to stick to what is the most comfortable uh for me especially when i'm performing you know on a space so um to realize that a uh, particular uh, you know happening and to change it has been a major you know try to improve on it or looking for a change has been one of the main concerns for me uh, in the past one year or so so i would like to know for, from you as to how uh, you know one should be handling with the monotony that one faces with himself or you know especially when it comes to his craft so how do we yeah that's the question i think i'm like for example to give you an example supposing i'm in in i'm rehearsing and uh, i think what has happened during rehearsal is quite interesting and quite uh, creative but the next day i reject that because whatever comes to me easily i have to reject that i never put myself in a comfort zone i be uh, i because i do feel that a rehearsal space is not about control it's not about the familiar it's about the intuitive it's about the intangible it's about uh, uh, my discomfort as an artist is proportion to my growth as an artist so i i i have to reject my own work for me to move forward i mean even if i see a play which i did 6 months ago i have to raise that completely i have to begin from a completely blank state uh, space there is a tendency that if something has worked really well and has been uh, remembered in the minds and the hearts of the audience you hold on to it and you want to somewhere let it creep into your new work but to me that is very dangerous that's a very dangerous unless you reject yourself and reject your own work you cannot really create anything afresh so okay. uh, i mean for me it's theater is not a space about being comfortable i was asking one of my actors who's worked with me for 30 years called ramanjeet i said you come all the way from calcutta from so far to work with me Uh, you know leaving your children behind your home behind your life behind why do you do that she says ma'am because you're continuously making me feel i know nothing and i have to begin from point zero my intention is not to damage anybody's spirit or damage anybody's sense of self but to make them realize that art is hard to do a work uh, a fresh work of art you have to actually erase everything that you know to begin from a blank state space to be like a baby to take the first steps this is one more question i wanted to ask you i'm really sorry if i'm taking a lot of time uh, but oh, no uh, so uh, how does a school of thought uh, uh, help with this i mean we go there are so many schools like of techniques and sir is can good so uh, how should an act, uh, actor you know look at all these techniques and abide by them how would you want us uh, i mean suggest uh, an acting student you know having been to drama school and having been a teacher at university for 28 years uh, mm -hmm. teaching theoretical concepts uh with stanislavski or but all brack smear hole tero gotowski arthod ariana manushkin and bugat you know having read peter brook having read so much theoretical concepts i think theory to have a knowledge of theoretical uh, uh theoretical concepts is very important it's not that you're dipping into this i'm not saying this is my stanislavski moment but this is my mere hold moment but somewhere i think knowledge information transformed into knowledge transformed into experience transformed into practice is a very 
unconscious journey. Yeah. As I said, I have no method, but I'm sure I do have one. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always write about my work after the work has been completed. Mm. I cannot write about my work, about the production that I'm doing prior to the process that I have been through. So mm. I think, I think theoretical concepts and to understand literature, reading, you have to read. You have to be permeable to allow all those thoughts to ingest within you. Yeah. Uh, those are very essential because they somewhere give you validation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, but I trust my intuition to just give you yeah. one or two examples. Like, for example, you know, I was doing this play in 2000. So it's an old example. I was doing a play called Kitchen Katha, which is about women and food. You know, where I had uh, people, uh, you know, the actors cooking, singing, uh, serving the audience, eating themselves. The songs were strung of recipes. Bibi Karant, who I worked with for 22 years after I left Bharat Bhavan, had composed the music for all the shows that I did till he died in 2002 and was one of my closest friends and collaborators. Uh, all the musical instruments that were used were, uh, you know, pisna, chakki, uh, chonkna, you know, all the sounds of the kitchen, the bartan, the, uh, you know, the sounds of the kitchen. And um, I remember the set was actually set like a kitchen with people grinding, pounding, uh, making rotis. Then I had a little... Uh, a little bamboo doorway and on that I had a small swing and on that swing I had a pumpkin. Okay. So my actor asked me, why this pumpkin? I said, I don't know. It just seems right. Mm -hmm. There was no reason for it. There was no logic. There was no rationality. Mm -hmm. And then I found many years okay. later, I was in, I did Kitchen Katha in Chennai. And uh, we decided to go and visit Pondicherry. So we went to Pondicherry and I saw that outside each shop, there was a pumpkin mm -hmm. and they would put that little tillock on it, you know, like mm -hmm. in shops, you have a deity or whatever. So I asked the shopkeeper, Ye, why do you have this kandu outside? You know, why the pumpkin? He said, it's good luck. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself that there's a racial memory also we were carrying. We carry. Mm -hmm. This was the first time I was going to Pondicherry. So I was not carrying any image of that somewhere in my being. So mm -hmm. our, our mind and our body is like an archive. Yeah. It is archiving racial collective memory. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have learned to trust that and pull it out in moments of great illogic. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I did a play, um, a Monto play, many shows, a story strung together at the NST called uh, Bitter Fruit, in which I have seen where the actors come on stage, they sit on a kind of a steps and they sit very uh, static, in a very static manner. They pull out a bottle of Coke from their uh, pockets, they time it and they open it, then they pull out a straw from their pocket and they start making sounds of sipping it. Why I wanted that, I can't understand. But that sipping, that sucking, and we're talking about partition, and we're talking about the problem of people with lost homelands, that whole uh, sucking of the uh, coke through the pipe became a very, became the sound that I was searching for. Because what is rehearsal? Rehearsal is a ritual. It's a ritual to arrive at some kind of exactitude. What kind of exactitude? It's like Stanislavski said, uh, I try, I work very hard to make my actors spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So, what is it that we do during rehearsals? We create an exactitude of the external world in which the actor is placed. The objects he uses, the choreography, the the uh, the the emphasis on how he says his lines because the inner landscape which is the landscape of feelings emotions are very difficult to summon up at will you can't pull them out so you have to resort to what is 
what you externally establish through the whole process of rehearsals. Because the word rehearsal actually means repetition. It's a mm -hmm. ritual. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much. I, I work a lot on my instincts. I, I work on sometimes something illogical strikes me and I try it out. And sometimes mm -hmm. the actors look at me a little askance. But uh, it just it's just something that uh, I've learned to trust. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Neelamji, uh, you, men uh, you mentioned uh, two words like intuitive and uh, racial memory, all those things. And uh, Devika was asking about the craft of the actor, the repetition, that uh, things which somebody has already done coming back, etc. So how do you break this surface and put the intuition out and uh, make the actor really in it? Is there any kind of uh, approaches you specifically do to break the exterior and uh, their acquired craft and to be uh, really intuitive and flowing to that uh, situation, memory or the content or the, the idea which you have? which is haunting you uh, to do that play. Well, so um, practically approach. Well, you know, as I said, I have no system. But I do try to create a space of trust. I try to create a space where I allow them to take risks or tell them, take risks, put your imagination. I'm sure we can put something else in this. This is working very well. But let's put something else. Let's put something more magic. Let's, then I give them objects. Because for me, and I use a lot of ab objects on the stage. I do feel that we are animated. Our world is, a real world is also surrounded by objects. You know, we have chairs and tables and this is my pen and this is my shirt and this is the place where I sit when I have my khana. So we do live in a world which is surrounded by objects. So I've never been able to understand this debate about, an, you know, why should people have, you know, what is this realism? In one way, I'm not doing realistic theater. I'm skewing realism. But on the other hand, I animate my stage with a lot of real objects. To me, the objects are also actors. They extend the meaning of the narrative. And because I'm a woman and I'm a housewife and I live in a home and my theater is in my house and my rehearsal space is in my house. So all the objects that animate my performance really come from the kitchen, really come from domesticated spaces. So those domesticated spaces, how they kind of transform and become something else, become a metaphor is something that I'm looking for. It's like Bertolt Brecht would say, making the surprised by the familiar or making the familiar unfamiliar. How do you do that? That if you chawal khare ho, wo chawal nahi hai. You know, like the last play we did, uh, Gum Hai, which I'm referring to, this person has a tree with a barbed wire, which becomes land and uh, whatever. And he has a mound of rice. That rice also becomes many things. It becomes something to eat. It also becomes to show about family dynamics. It also becomes about identity. So how to see in that, the, the, the image that you choose, many other dimensions that you want to explore in the text, what you call the unwritten text, not even the subtext. The text which is not written, but may have been written in the mind of the playwright. So how deep you dig is, is what I try to explore. And through that, when you take away that, when you tell them that it can become many things, a sheet can become many things, like in Naga Mandala, a piece of cloth became the snake. If I throw a suggestion on the stage, or the, I beg your pardon, not me, but when the actor throws a suggestion on the stage, if he does it with, if he fills it with faith, if he fills it with conviction, then that conviction reaches out to the audience and they get pulled into that conviction and also start believing that 
The piece of cloth is a snake. I'd like to ask a question, Neelanji. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> you said that through rehearsals, you explore, you improvise to find an exactitude. And once you find that exactitude or what you think fits, do we continue improvising or do we fix that and say, okay, this is fixed. And even if you have, let's say, 10 or 15 shows coming up, do you still venture into improvisation or do you stay with that exactitude? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I remember when I went to do a play at the NSC the first time, um, uh, Shantanu Bose, who was the dean of the um, NSC, told the actors, I'm warning you that Neelam, even five minutes before a performance is capable of changing. So you please be prepared. So, yes, I do feel that um, that nothing uh, nothing is uh, you nothing is uh, fixed. You don't become rigid. You don't fall in love with your own work. If you've arrived at a moment, it's like what uh, Stanislavski says that spontaneity is or improvisation is is used to uh, to find the moment but what we are looking for is the moment itself so that moment itself is subjected to a little more leering there is no end to leering so yes I am uh, I remember once I was doing a show of Naga Mandala and uh, uh, the last scene I'm sitting in the wings I never see my play but I see it through the wings. In the wings, I'm seeing the play unfold, and I, I suddenly got a, I suddenly got a certain thought. So when the two actors who are playing the role of Ran, Rani come backstage, I said, "Look, I want you to use that moment in the last scene." And they, and because actors are work have who have worked with me are perhaps familiar with my slightly whimsical behavior, and they also have to be convinced. They also felt, "Yeah, ma'am, it's going to work." It's not that I'm not, I, I think the word director seems to suggest control. It seems to suggest authority. It seems to suggest a masculinity. But I do not believe that as a theater, I'm in control. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm continuously having a dialogue, a conversation with my actors. If they reject something, we talk about it. I try to convince them. And they try to convince me. So there's a continuous kind of conversation between equals. That is part of also the process of our working. But yes, I do feel nothing is fixed. I mean, I did Nagamandala three times. The first time I did Nagamandala was in 89. And I must say that it was really so generous of Girish Karnat. I wrote to him. He was a good friend of Karanji's. I'd met him once or twice. When I wrote to him, I told him that I read about his play and I wanted to, uh, it excited me and if you could send me the script. And he sent me a handwritten version of uh, the English text, which he, which had not yet been published. And he came to Delhi to see the play. And in the book, he had actually posted pictures from my production, and which he enjoyed immensely, which was in 1989, as I said. Then in 2005, he asked me if I could revive the play. But I feel there's no retrospective in theatre. Theatre is born today and dies at night. Every day is a new day. You know, so it's not that... Uh, I don't think... Um, uh, uh, I don't think that... I think you have to think afresh. I can't... I always tell my actors that whatever line you speak, even if you've done 80 shows or 60 shows or 40 shows, you must feel as if you are saying the lines for the first time. You have to keep on discovering what that word means. So in 2005, I did a new version, a fresh version, which is very difficult because you have to see if the play still speaks to you. Uh, but I felt equally excited and more layers were revealed. And things that I'd missed in 89 seemed to be uh, coming back to me with a different kind of force and energy. 
the positioning, the interpretation naturally went through a metamorphosis. Um, uh, then in 2014, yes, I think 2014, he asked me to do it again. Now, 2004, 2014, 10 years had elapsed. And it's very difficult because the music had been designed by B.B. Karan. How do I recast the music? Some of the actors were the same. Some were new actors. How do you kind of re... How do you tell them to get rid of um, what had become fixed in their memory? <laughs> so it's, it's a whole process of erasure, uh, ruptures, new uh, new ways of looking at it because actors also fall in love with what they've done how do you tell them that that self-love is very dangerous they have to start from point zero and grow from there thank you thank you um hi i'm nanda kumar i mean it's a little extension of what you've been just talking about improvisation i mean it's a wild thought that just comes to my mind when you're on stage, you know, the inspiration for, a, uh, for, a, for something to do different comes, can come anytime. So when you're actually, if, if before the play starts, if you are able to discuss it and you're able to perform the uh, improvisation, yes, it is well and good. Everybody is in sync with it. But when you are on stage and you find something which you can perform, which could be different, how does, how do you handle it? How does a director, as a director, if a director is a separate person, how does a director handle it? And how do the other actors uh, handle that situation when you are impromptu on the stage? No, I don't let that happen. Once a rehearsal is over and things have been decided and decisions, creative decisions and creative things have happened, an actor can't get a burst of spontaneity and do something completely uh, unexpected. We have, we rehearse endlessly. For me, rehearse, the process is far more exciting than the actual production because I love the whole process of trial and error, the, 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 the whole journey that we take together. The actors are the arbiters of the stage, but once you're on the stage, they can't suddenly get a wild uh, thought and uh, implement it. No, that is, that, is not, that is not ethically allowed because you have not, take, you've not made the whole, because the whole group has to be uh, complicit or have to be uh, in agreement with what is happening. So that is certainly not something that um, is is something I would manage. And it's not about control. It's not about authority. It's about knowing that this is a collective art where a group of people come together and make a work of art together, bringing their own experiences, their own... Because ultimately, what does it do to the body of the actor? What do the words do to the body of the actor? What, what does it do in dynamics with the co-actor? All of them have been worked out. There is precision. There is... There is a calculation. There is a setting that has happened after three months or two months or two and a half months of rehearsal. So on the, on the day of the performance, that can't be tampered with and that can't be unhinged and taken somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Jolly, you are not audible. Okay. Hello. Ah, yes. No, no, not audible. Hello. Hello, yes, right now. No. Hello. Hello is audible. Hello is audible, then no. To speak or, or type, you can type also. Uh, yeah, that, that would be great. I can pass over. Yeah, I can type. You can type your question also. We can pass it over.
I will do it later. Please do continue. Please do continue. I will do it later. I cannot hear you. He is saying that he will ask later, sir. We can come. Okay. So we have a question on chat box. Yeah. Oh, Arundhati Nag is there. To oh. welcome, Arundhati. We are not seeing you. Arundhati Nag says hello to Arundhati. Ah, hello, everyone. Thanks hello, for being here. Oh, nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you, Neelam. You're my favorite person. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> oh, everything is so lovely. Whatever you said, I really. We need a recording, and we'd like to share it with more people. Chandra doesn't. We are recording it. We are recording it, but we have to. Uh, yeah. And just also, there's a wild thought behind me. So we have uh, some very beautiful uh, intercessions. Yes. We have recorded uh, almost them. We are trying to transcribe it, maybe then edit it or send back to the speakers. Um, ask them to correct it if needed, and maybe bring out a book or something like that if there's a publisher. We are just have a wild thought like that also, but we are recording yes. it. Uh, we are not just throwing it away. Great, great, great. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to take up the air time. Yeah, Nilam, share. <laughs> yeah. Somebody had a question. Yeah, he's not getting. I have one more question. I'm just. If if it's okay to, for me to ask another. Oh answer. yes, sure, sure. Uh, so, like you mentioned um, about the improvisation and how to get back on the actors and giving them feedback so as to not, uh, you know, demolish their uh, uh, ego as such. So, uh, for me, uh, if compelled, if it feels like an extremely safe environment to perform, I believe most of the uh, actors let their trauma uh, traumas manifest through their uh, to themselves, into the environment, um, you know, around them, and perform, you know, actually perform through their traumas and demonstrate it. Uh, especially the, you know, during the short while we spent with you, you encouraged us uh, to, you know, talk about our personal loss, protest, and very sensitive, and uh, uh, things which has the possibility to make an, an actor feel extremely vulnerable, uh, you know, uh, something which is extremely personal to an actor to be present in front of a set of people. So, uh, so it does feel, uh, you know, after the performance to, uh, to hear that, you know, some, you could have done that, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there could have been more clarity in the thought. The, the other suggestions feels like a bit of, um, you know, criticism. So uh, I would like to ask to how an actor should be able to look at this whole scenario. And I would like to know how as a director, uh, you get to the point wherein you feel that it's safe to say and uh, express the opinion regarding the performance. I haven't fully uh, got your question because there were a little uh, uh, a word that would just disappear. But uh, I think from what I figured out, you said that something that Affect impacted me personally. How I could put that in a public space? Am I correct? Like, yeah. Sometimes you. Uh, I, I, I would like to. I would like to answer that. I think the personal is political. You know, whatever you do is personal. Comes from a personal space. But how that personal, personal impulse or the personal emotion is transformed is uh, through the heat of your own creativity is. Um, is what makes it from singular into a plurality. Because I think everything that you do, every, there is no single interpretation. There is no single story. 
They are multiple stories. There may be a single story that could be your starting point, but how that single story multiplies and becomes a story of the group that you're working with is the whole journey that you take in a rehearsal space. It's like Henry Miller says that when you write something, you wear the robe of a priest. It's not that you do some self-flagellation or some self-indulgence. Whatever choices you make in life, you know, like for the last uh, seven, eight years, I find that whatever work I'm doing has to do with the voiceless, the disenfranchised, what it means to be a refugee, uh, what home means to you, when you leave your home in a hurry, never to return, what do you take with you? Old letters, yeah, yeah. photographs, yeah, yeah. Oh. anything to remind you that what you once left behind did exist. So this could be my own personal story. But is that personal story communicable to a larger, in a larger space, is the challenge. I think everything, even if you write a novel, you write from your own personal experience. You mm -hmm. write from your own personal pain, joys, uh, uh, you know, what you've seen, heard, whatever I am today, what I've eaten, what I've expunged, what I've read, the friends that I have made, the conversations that I've had, the productions that I've seen, they all formulate and create the person I am. So, you know, there is, and, it, and within that, there is also the me that interprets it. The me that sees it. We can both be seeing the same play. But what I experience from the play could be completely different from what you experience from the play. Let me stop here and tell you a story. Many years ago, I took Yerma to a show in London at, at the London International Festival of Theatre. And there's a scene in the play. In retrospect, it seems quite a stupid scene, but obviously it made an impact at that time. Where you know, Yarma kills her husband because of whatever reasons. It's a Federico Garcia Lorca play. And in the, in, Lorca has written that she strangles him to mm -hmm. death. To me, that didn't seem, uh, seem like an interesting uh, uh, theatrical moment to lunge at his neck and kill him. So I tried to deconstruct what death means. The panstatva, the white sheath, the pot, and it's, and it's a murder, so there's blood. So the last scene had this white sheet coming out of nowhere, and she throws the pot at him, the pot towards the, the water, which is red, red paint, on the white sheet, and then breaks the pot, and then there's a whole beautiful music that B.D. Karanth had created of uh, Rudali, uh, mm. Sound of Mourning, which was mm -hmm. quite brilliant, I think. That was a brilliant piece of creation. The mm -hmm. next day, I got a review in The Guardian, which said uh, that the last scene, it was like the blood of Christ, the stilling of the menstrual cycle. These were things that were not even in my mind when I, in, when I created that scene. But the interpretation, the interpretation that was given in a certain way, expanded my idea of the narrative in ways which were very interesting for me. So my, my impulse in, in behind creating a moment and how it is received mm. doesn't have to have a tal main, doesn't have to match. Mm. Because everybody mm. brings their own understanding of what they are experiencing. In the same mm. way, if I take a tale because of my present state of being, just like when I did those plays and everything stems from the self, but it doesn't mm. end with the self. Mm. It, it, it goes through the heat of transformation and becomes something else, something very far removed from myself. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um. And that choice is my personal choice. But I don't reveal my personal choice. I don't tell them I've chosen this because of that. Mm. 
Milan ji, Jolie from Puducherry, uh, Jolie Puducherry from um, Hyderabad was trying to ask you uh, whether you could elaborate uh, a little more on the material you select uh, for the domestic realm. Can you, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on the choices of uh, the materials, especially in the domestic uh, kind of surrounding situation? I think he asked the question because many of your later productions have, have a lot of domestic materials inside, kitchen, a lot of trunks and materials like that. So how do you uh, get into that and how does it become part of the design? See, the, the choice is not random. It is certainly thought through. Uh, like, for example, in Kitchen Katha, the first time she makes love, uh, I chose a pomegranate, which she opens and the juice flows out on a little uh, piece of white cloth. It comes from many references. It's not that it is just picked up and said, Chalo, kuch karte hai. You know, there's that whole song of Solomon in the Bible, which has to do with the pomegranate and it has to do with sexuality. So they're, they're, this is the way the references start emerging. Again, in Kitchen Katha, I had her, uh, you know, when she hears that her lover has been, has chosen another bride, I have somebody pour atta over her through a sieve and she becomes almost like a white statue. So they came from many references. Sometimes the references are, uh, are, um, are coming from a very... Uh, but you would say simple source. I remember when I was a kid, I saw this film Taj Mahal and Pradeep Kumar was doing the role of Shah Jahan and he locks himself in the room and they keep on knocking and he does Shen Shah, Pai Nikli and Nikli. Well, he doesn't come out of his room. After many days, he comes out of his room and he's completely, his, his hair has turned white. So that image became very strong in my mind. And the image of Madhubala in Anarkali, where she's like a white, uh, she's a white statue. So everything stems from something I've seen, heard, how it's transformed, like the laundress is seen in Yarma. My father was a doctor and he was, uh, uh, we lived in the medical college complex and right next to the driveway, we had a long driveway which took us to our house. There was a dhobi ghat where all the, uh, sheets and all the clothes were washed off the Gurdwara, uh, uh, sorry, of the, uh, uh, the medical students, the sheets, the clothes, uh, the, the, the coats that the doctors wore. So I as a child used to go there, roll up my salwar and wash with them and the whole sound of slapping and soap suds. That was such a that obviously embedded itself in my spirits. So when I did uh, uh, Liyarma, and there's a laundress scene, which is one of the most significant scenes in uh, Lorca's play, all the images and all the thoughts of washing, squeezing, drying off the pagaris, the sadis, they all kind of, they all kind of came gushing back to me. And Kitchen Katha really stemmed from the fact that my father's family lived in a Gurdwara. They came from a certain reformatory Sikh movement called the Nirankari movement. The Guru Gaddi was in our house. So as a child, I would go there and I would see, spend a lot of time in the langar. So the concept of the langar, the millions of balls, the atta, the bales of uh, anaj that were lying in the kitchen. So everything that you gather inside you, what do you gather inside you and how do you carry it on your back and how does it enter into your workspace are the mysteries of creativity. Yes. Yes, Jolie. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine, okay. Uh, uh, can I have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, my question is like uh, I'm curious about how you pick uh, choose the artist when you are uh, like uh, 
uh, you are thinking of a play or you have like you said there is no thought process is like blank and all yeah well you know i've had a company theater company where i've had actors working with me continuously for 32 years so they have been very much part of my group um when you work with a group which has been together for 32 years to develop a certain level of belief in each other's work and each other's possibility and potentiality uh, so lot so i think that certainly does lead to a space where a certain language of working has already been established has already been developed has already been nurtured has already been uh, refined into the language or the vocabulary or the grammar within which you construct and work on performance but since the last 4 years 5 years because most of these actors naturally moved away they moved to bigger cities they wanted to seek their fortune in films so the thing became a bit scattered they still we we are still together and i know if i did a play they would be very happy to come but because they are busy in other dimensions of their life the time available is less so for 4 5 since 5 years i formed a new little small company of actors who come from drama school and some actors from the nst they were young they were in their uh, mid 20s late 20s it took a long time because the first play i did with them dark borders Uh, which was in 2018 i think not so long time ago 2017 it took me at least 3 3 and a half months to work with them to get them in tune with the fact that i was not working in a real in with realism with high realism it was not um within the methods that they had been trained in so we were trying to explore something new so for two months we did no work we just we just kind of improvised did certain exercises did workshop material it is only in the last 15 20 days we started dovetailing and knitting and stitching the play together so it is a complex process it is a much more difficult and challenging process but that's the way it is so yeah it does take time even when i go to the nst Uh, and i'm really surprised i did 3 days of work with them because then or 2 days of work with them and then the institution had to shut down because they got because of the pandemic and they have all been sending me their work and i'm really so surprised and so moved by the fact that 2 days of working from 2 o'clock till 9 o'clock certainly gave them a insight into uh the directions that they needed to a challenge themselves into entering so they would send me their work i would send them notes then they would redo the work and then they would send it back then i would give some more little suggestions so i think it's what i'm doing is not new it's not uh, the, that i'm the only person who's, who's doing it abhilash pillay is doing it deepan is doing it anuradha kapoor is doing it anamika haksa is doing it so there are many people who are getting away from what you call the well made text where scripts uh as ready made even if you're working with the pre existing text as i said you're trying to you're trying to see the text not as a not as a closed text or an absence of exchange but the opening of a conversation between the text and yourself and your actors and your designers Uh, here's a question. Uh, here's a question from uh, Sujit Kumar Reddy. Uh, can I? He has typed it. Can I read it? Uh, he types. Everything happens on the stage is false. Theatre is falsehood, as uh, you mentioned. So, can you explain more about it uh, from the perspective of the actor, uh, and how you help the actor to find out the truth, uh, the truth in the actions? Uh, can you explain the importance of the set and portray metaphorically shows any text something like that well it's really a search you try to get to the truth of the character the the uh, the, the dichotomy is that when the actor cries 
when the character cries, is, is it the actor or the character that cries? So this kind of play of what is real, what is false, you know, being the subject, being the object, you, you are doing, but you're also watching yourself doing, you are the object and you're also the subject. It's, it's, a very, it's, it's actually a technique. You know, it's like Anne Bogart, Bogart says, there are three things you need to be an actor or to be a creative person. You need something to say. You need technique and you need passion. So technique is very important. Even, you know, when, when drama schools are training people into Kathakali or Kuriyatam or yoga or uh, different kind of physical work, or they get somebody from Pina Bausch's school to teach them about contemporary movement, contemporary dance, and et cetera, et cetera. It is not so much to make them into Kathakali artists or to make them into uh, Kuriyatam actors or to make them do Kalari. It is basically to unlock their imagination. You, you free your body, you free the imagination. So the the, the language of the imagination, there are no limits to imagination, but there are limits to the body. The more you push your body to transcend the limits of what it can manage, you somewhere also set into, set into motion the freeing of the imagination. And, uh... She has also asked about uh, the relationship between the audience and the, oh no, uh, the importance of the set and portray how the set metaphorically portrays the text. Well, you know, I think uh, for me, when I work with my own theatre company, the set, just like the actor develops, the set also develops. Just like the actor moves, the set also moves. You know, you bring things in, you take them, you, you then abandon them or you put them somewhere else. But the last couple of productions that I've done with the NST, I worked with uh, Deepan Shivaraman and I think the set has really helped because, you know, when we work individually, we don't have the money, we don't have the, uh, the infrastructure to create really uh, uh, a set of any consequence. But Deepan is a scenographer and I think the you know, he, he sees many, many rehearsals that I do there. And then he will make suggestions about what can be placed and what can be uh, against which the actor can be framed. And I do feel that it hugely acts to the, the whole um, uh, level of the performance. And it also helps the actor. If the actor knows what it's touching, what it's feeling, what it's smelling, it certainly does enhance his his own uh, ex, uh, his own experience, his own um, um, uh, sense of being in a space which feels can be contextualized in ways where he feels that he's completely at home. I mean, like let me put this differently. Like for example, when I start a play, when I the first, the, once I know that this is what is going to happen, I always make the actors act wear costumes. I always make them have their objects. I make them, by the time the show comes, if I'm doing a play which is to do with new costumes, the costumes are in tatters because for two months they have worn those costumes. I'm not one of those directors who will hand a pagri at the last minute or hand an object at the last minute or say, let's save budget and not have all the paraphernalia that is required, which is perishable and is required per rehearsal or per show. I make all the requirements that are necessary for the actor to get into the space of the character available to the actor. I mean, I always say that the truth of an action leads to the truth of an emotion. If the actor has to write a letter on the stage, he must actually write the letter, not mind that he's writing something. If he's got to drink, have dal chawal, the dal chawal should actually be uh, what he would enjoy. You know, uh, it's not that 
I mean, it should actually be hot tea. So there is, you could say that this is hyper-realism. But it is actually, in these are the tools, so these are the, uh, yeah, these are the, these are the really, the, the external um, objects that you give an actor for him to become more truthful to what he is doing. Yeah, and uh, there's a question from uh, Supriya Samajda, he's from Kolkata. Uh, he asked you, Ma'am, I saw your kitchen kata. You used many things in the play, you tried to bring reality. Your actors cook their end of the play, they share that to the audience. So how how you see the relationship between the audience and the performer? That's a question. Well, I think... Uh you really know, you really get to know your play on the day there's an audience that sees it. The audience is a vital link in making you comprehend whether the play has in any way connected with an audience. What is that invisible thread that is released from the audience, released by the actors? that invisible sutra that is released, that binds together an audience which is a collective of people coming from different emotional, economic, social worlds. What is that thread that binds them together? Uh, so the audience does play a very vital role in a completion of the performance that you have created. I mean, try performing in an empty space to an empty audience. It's not the same. I think the actor gets his energy from the response of the audience. But in contradiction to what I've said, when I'm making a play, the audience is never entering into my mind. It is me and the actors. And we are trying to create a certain world on the stage. We're trying to create a world with its emotions, with its ups and downs, with its affirmation with its savagery but once it comes on the stage then I erase myself I become like a ghost I never see any of my plays I just disappear somewhere because now the the the, the performance belongs to the actors and it is received by the audience and what the audience throws back is then picked up by the actors and taken further Uh, I'll uh, I'll try to add something to that. Uh, no, uh, when you're performing, you made a play and you're performing in say Chandigarh, and the same performance you are taking to Delhi or say Kerala or somewhere else, where the audience perspective, the habit, and uh, their expectations are different. So, how uh, does this change of the perspective of the audience, their expectations and their reactions uh, affect? Uh, the performance or the next uh, coming product means performance of the same play. How do you take the reactions and responses along with? Uh, how do you make up for the change in uh, the perspective of the audience as such? Well, the play remains the same. The play cannot change. The performance oh. cannot change. It remains the same. But I think language is one dimension of a performance. They also, I, I always create a parallel text which is the visual text. To me, the visual text and, the, and, the, and it's being animated by objects. And I use a lot of metaphors. Metaphor for me is a tool because the, met, the word, meaning of the word metaphor is transport, the transportation of ideas. So metaphor becomes a very important dimension in whatever I do, which I think does go beyond language. Or the, and language to me is not only words. It's sound, it's cultural history, it's visual uh, imagery, it's many, many things. So um, language is one dimension. I can, I can very happily watch a play coming from Manipur or coming from Kerala, uh, despite not knowing the language. I think sometimes, I'm not saying that it's a perfect way of viewing. Here, if I could tell another story. Uh, again, it has to do with one of the plays that I took to, uh, to a foreign country. 
and it said the company presents the Mad Woman of Sheyo, uh, written by Jean Giraudoux, um, performed by Neelaman Singh Chaudhary, presented by whatever, whatever. Now, as you know, there is a lot of this cross-cultural um, uh, traffic that's going on, where we call a foreign director to work with the play at the NST, or you might or at Ranga Shankara, or at uh, Lok Dharmi. So this kind of interaction is going on. So they, uh, after the show, there is always this question-answer session. So there were two girls sitting in the front row, and they said, you know, when we came to see the play, we, thought, we just presumed it was in French or English or whatever language. Oh. And the moment the play started, we heard these very foreign sounds, you know, the tumbi, the and Karanji's music and, uh, you know, the sound seemed so alien. We felt quite startled. And then the play opened and we heard sounds which we didn't even know which language it was, whether it was Russian or Chinese or, you know, we had no, uh, 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 no um, association with the sounds that were emanating from the state. They said after 10 minutes, we got so sucked in and we were almost grateful that we didn't know the language. Because we could understand, we knew the text, we knew the script. But what we could now figure out is that we were not interested in the narrative. We were interested in the subtext, the images, the interpretation that was so different from any of the Western productions that we had seen of this classical play. So I think a serious theatre audience, because you also have casual saunterers and you have people who are actually deeply interested in theatre. When they come, they are not, they're looking for many things. They're looking for a different experience, which is an unfamiliar experience. Basically, to go to the theatre is to also surrender. You have to surrender to the fact that you are hearing the story told in a manner which is, which may not be fitting into your stereotypical um, a cliche uh, understanding of that script, but it could be done differently. I don't know. That's the way I go. So I'm just interpreting the way I would look at a play uh, and presuming that and hoping that other people also look at it in the same way. Of course, rejection is part of it. You know, some people, it works for some, it doesn't work for some. And one is susceptible one is vulnerable to both. Yeah. It's not that one is not vulnerable to both opinions. Because theatre is about uncertainty. It is about vulnerability. It is about not knowing. The journey you take in the isolation of your rehearsal space, when you bring that child out into a public space, into the, uh, into the light of uh, hundreds of possible judgments, you're naturally in a fragile space. It's not that you are hardened or inured to the responses. And every response is a valid response. It's not a response that can be dismissed or uh, not considered. Hello. Uh, may I ask something? Yeah, sure, Dr. Uh, hello, I'm Joaquin from uh, Spain. Uh, I saw that in your website, and you talked uh, before about it, you you directed uh, Germa of uh, Federico Garcia Lorca. And it is uh, very interesting to me to know uh, which uh, uh, transposition of cultural uh, uh, kind of life did you make to to the the Indian culture, no? from the Spanish culture to the Indian culture, and which the difficulties do you find in uh, in the play uh, in relation with another place that you directed? Well, I've also done blood wedding, so I've done both blood wedding and. Uh, Yerma of Lorca's. Um, I found that uh, both Punjab, where I come from, 
which is the northern part of India, and Lorca's Granada, so in Spain, they are both agricultural communities. They are both riddled with patriarchy and misogyny, and the way a woman is perceived. Uh, they are both subjected to high codes of honor and uh, imposition of moral pressures, which become the burden of women. So I found so much resonance, resonance that I did not have. I felt no need to adapt. Because even the imagery in Lorca's poetry is so close to the imagery in the Punjabi language, I found it quite startling. Because in the beginning, I thought maybe I should change the name. It's in uh, it's in um, uh, Yarma is a very Yarma, which means land, earth, fertility. Let's find an equivalent Punjabi name for my play because the play was done in Punjabi. But Yarma sounded so okay in the mouth of the actors that it almost became like a Punjabi name because we have a lot of names that end with ma, soma, you know, etc, etc. So I didn't feel the need to even change the name. They were, uh, it wasn't an adaptation, it was just a translation. And I worked with one of the leading poets in Punjab called Surjit Patar. And uh, uh, I mean, he's huge. So I felt Lorca's poetry and L Lorca's uh, work could only be translated by a writer of the same eminence or the same uh, uh, facility and the same grandeur. And, and uh, I remember when we performed it in London, uh, Lorca's uh, first girlfriend to whom he wrote that poem, The Butterfly, I don't remember the poet poem, came to see the play. She flew all the way from Madrid and she came to see the play. And she said, I thought I was listening to Spanish. Because Sp the, the Spanish language is so has the same consonants as the Punjabi language. Yeah. So um, I didn't feel the need to change anything. And I know that a lot of the reviews that I got in London, they said, I think only an Indian or Asian can understand Lorca's uh, uh, passion and blood. We Europeans who have done Lorca's uh, Yarma and Blood Wedding have bleached it dry of all the passion and emotions and the uh, power of his poetry to a very Anglo-Saxon way of looking at uh, man-woman relationship, yearning, loss. So I don't know, we had 28 shows in England um, 18 shows in London, and we were, it was, the response was really quite overwhelming. So Lorca is uh, very much loved as a playwright all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that I could discover Lorca through, uh, through working on his text. And when you work on a text, you just don't work on the text. You also then go through of course, I, I was at a disadvantage because I worked from the English translation. But the English translation was done by his brother. So it must, be, must have come closest to the way Lorca wished it to be seen. Mm. Okay, thank you. Unmute your mic and then ask questions or comments, whatever you would like to share. Or you can type it here on the chat box. We can have a few more minutes with Neela Mansingji with us. Oh, man, uh, this is Prem here. 
so uh, actually you had suggested right and you have told to make a character that uh, so, uh, seem very authentic like you had a quoted an example of if for example if i am having some rice from a bowl there should be rice in it actually so that it will for the character itself it will be very easy to portray it so i feel that's a very very interesting example can you give me more such examples like what you uh, employ to make characters more uh, convincing or uh, uh, like from a actor's point of view what more uh, could you give me some more examples which will make it easier for the actor to portray it more uh, convincingly and uh, you know easily to bring it more uh, uh, you know near to reality like what you told about eating something from a bowl and uh, if there is actually food in it it will become easier for him to portray that so could you give me some more examples like that like what you actually do in your place i think um, yeah. um then basically you create a place of trust where the actors feel that they can share the deepest um impulses of their being into that space now how do you create a space of trust you create it by um being non judgmental you create it by giving them the objects that they can play around with you make them like for example when i was doing nagamandala because my rehearsal space is very near uh the the garden you know it is uh, carved out from part of the garden uh, i told them that the opening scene which is about the scene of uh, the um flames you know which is such a interesting and such a amazing scene written by girish karnad where he makes imaginary characters with real characters illusion with reality you know so there is such an amazing kind of uh, a cohesiveness through which he creates and and such complex scene that he creates so i told them that i want them to they are escaping from their house at night um and who are they it's a chorus of flames and he puts it what happens when you switch off the light the light could be a diya it could be a lantern it could be a bulb uh, it could be a torch where does that light go which to me is a highly metaphysical question it's like death what happens when we die where do we go it's a mystery which has never been solved by any saint or any religious text so i told them that they are coming to this abandoned place why do they meet and the whole dialogue is based very much on uh, like gossipy women so i said we'll do it like they're going out for a picnic they're going for a picnic but i want you all to feel cramped you all escaped and you all run and you all tightly in uh, uh, positioned in a place so we got a wheel barrow because a garden has a wheel barrow so they got the wheel barrow and they all cramped can you imagine six people in one wheel barrow you know the kind of different positions where the leg is hanging where the arm is hanging and then they're carrying their packets of biscuits and their chai and they Uh, and they all lay out a, a picnic a picnic uh, a place and they start the gossip about the households in which they live what i'm trying to say is that from the first day itself they are they are taught to use the actual object if we are going to ultimately use it in a production they are actually taught to use that so it becomes so familiar that during the opening night all the objects that they use are objects that have become part of the extension of the character and because they become extension of the characters and because this familiarity the chips and the warts and uh, every day they are made to eat biscuits you have to teach an actor how to how to speak speech and also eat so you give them actual physical uh, stuff that they're going to use on stage so through this Uh, through this process you know if they have to have a bath they have to have a bath every day if they have to make a mud pie they make a mud pie if they have to make popcorns they cook pop they 
they do the popcorns every day. So as I said right in the beginning, the truth of an action leads somewhere, sometimes there's a possibility, it leads to the truth of an emotion. You can't have the woman, you know, who's doing your pocha or cooking your food, because koi khaiga to nahi. You know, so all the elements that are required uh, to make that object come alive, if those are given to the actor by a strange process of osmosis, something else starts unfolding or unlocking within him. Then the smells, you know, I, uh, uh, smells are a very important part. I, I feel that we've explored the visual, the audio, the physical. But for me, I also put a lot of the olfactory in my place. The, the sense of smell. That to me is as, uh, you know, the five senses become integral dimensions that willy-nilly seem to enter every play. And then I was very fortunate. I worked with two masters. I worked with Abraham al as a student who was a Renaissance man who taught us about detailing, about characterization, about entries and exits, about composition. And B.V. Karanth, who was from the Gubbi company, who, was, uh, who worked with Shivram Karanth, and he uh, was a, knew the Yakshagan, and he was an expert at, uh, um, uh, in the folk traditions. And uh, so there were these two magical uh, teachers that I had. And the alchemy of what they taught me became the third dimension through which I worked. I hope I can never be accused of copying them, but the impact that they left on me was so profound and so deep. And they told me one thing, that whatever work you do, at least Karen's told me that, you must do it by forgetting us. You must create your own language of work. You must create your own uh, imagery. You must create your own sound patterns. And he worked with my group for 22 years, where he taught them to use traditional instruments in a non-traditional manner. For many years after he died, because the formation of the group had taken place, whenever I uh, used music, I could never write my name as the music composer. I felt compelled to put his name, like he's, because he still existed. He was still a presence in our group. So, um, so I've, I've also been uh, fortunate enough to have had these two really meaningful and powerful experiences that, that taught me that reject all that you have learned from us. Don't go down that road. Find your own language. Find your own vocabulary. Find your own grammar of framing. Uh, Nilanji, there is a question from uh, Dr. Sina. She would love to hear more about uh, Gamhe and seven stages of grieving. Uh, the depth of the seven stages of Aboriginal story portrayed through one woman performance and history of the missing women or girl child uh, in India. Uh, she has done her uh, search on the Aboriginal uh, history and uh, life of the Australians. So that may be the reason she... You know, I saw this production in London in 1997 and um, it was done by one woman an aboriginal actor where she talks about the whole history of dislocation of disenfranchisement of being be where your home is taken away where your identity is taken away where your language is taken away i was very impacted by it and she gifted me with the text. But there was no way I could make it my own because the circumstances under which the whole um, uh, the history of the text, the raison for its existence had no resonance in my life. But there were certain bits and pieces which I could relate to when I picked it up almost 20, in 97 and 2019, so I don't know how to calculate, but so many years later, there were bits and pieces that I could string together where I took a central idea of uh, 
the stories, the testimonies actually, rather than stories. They were personal stories of people who, and they were collected and performed by a single artist, where um, I, I added something in front and added something to any make something which has inspired you, how you make it your own, you internalize it, you contextualize it, you nativize it, you localize it, and then the work is presented. So I'm giving that background. And um, um, we didn't use all the stories, we used some of it, which had to do with police brutality, which had to do with the... Uh, um, the fear, a certain age, I mean, even my age and some generation younger than me may have it. The fear we have of what we call government, the fear that we have of the police, what you call the custodians, the custodians that are there to protect us when they turn predators. Uh, how do we deal with it? So there were certain, there were certain ideas, as I said, I take ideas, I, I take ideas from different texts with full acknowledgement. And those ideas, then I make them go through what I used the word earlier, the heat of transformation. You know, I, I transform them and the actors make it their own. I make it my own. When I, when I give that idea to the actor and we talk and we think and we improvise and we work on it, and then the chiseling and what is retained, what is rejected, what is kept, what is refined, what is made communicable is a whole, uh, it's a whole uh, technique and a whole system and a whole, um, it consumes you, it consumes me and it consumes the actors. And uh, there are a few questions about uh... The work you will do with the actors, like uh, how you change a person from a performer to an actor, and uh, how to help him find the soul of the character, and uh, how do you work? And another question regarding, like, say, how do you work with an? What do you think an actor is? Is he need to be trained, or what do you? So suppose you are working with a very raw actor. So how will you approach him, etc. It's the process of uh, working with the actor and the character, performer, actor, character, performer, and the person. I think there's no single approach. There are multiple approaches. I remember when I was a student of Alkazi's, I in second year, you can choose your specialization. And he said, uh, I think you should not take acting, you should take direction. I said, no, I want to take acting because I was terrified of drawings and drafts and I'm 10 thumbs, you know, I have no idea how to do stuff like that. And I enjoyed the yoga class and the music class. And for me, when I started off, I mean, I really joined the NST as an accident. It was more to make life more interesting than any burning ambition towards the arts. I knew the word art, it was floating in my head but I had no contours of its business. And as a, as a person who grew up in Amritsar, in most middle-class homes, you can see art as a hobby, but as a profession, there's no, there's no uh, example in that society for your parents to give you the space to be able to think or be an artist. It's all so conventional, it's so locked in, um, so actually it was all a series of accidents. So when I said, no, I want to do uh, acting, because I knew, then interesting then you know, I'll at least have had fun in life. So he said, no, you need two qualities to be a director. And I, I feel that you can develop those qualities within you. One is you need to be a psychologist and the other is you need to be a leader. Because you have to have qualities of leadership because a, a group that you form is a collection of separate people, separate temperaments, capricious, eccentric, um, uh, timid, uh, angry, 
coming for different reasons. How do you intuit this separate group and try to make them into some kind of cohesive, uh, singular um, space that they are occupying? On the other hand, you have to be a leader because you have to know how to put this separate group of people together. They have to believe in you. You have to convince them. So I was quite flattered that he saw these two qualities in me because I was a completely hopeless student and continued to be hopeless till I passed out. And then a series of wonderful accidents brought me to the place that I am. I got married. I, my husband got a posting to Bhopal. So I was at the right place at the right time. Bharat Bhavan was coming up. Ashok Bajpayee was secretary culture. I had an introduction to him through some friends in Bombay because we were in Bombay prior to moving to Bhopal. And I rang him up and he invited me over, invited me and my husband over. And because I think by sheer virtue of being from the NST and Bhopal was a small city and I was the only NSTian there. Uh, so I was given a job to work in Bharat Bhavan. My duties were very ambiguous. There was nothing defined. I was told to buy the curtains for the offices. I was told to provide food when some guests came. I was asked to host parties because I had a house with a sofa and six plates. So, you know, it seemed like a place where they could host visitors. But I think it was life altering for me because I was at the right place at the right time. And B.V. Karanth was invited to uh, head the Rang Mandal which is the first Hindi repertory that was coming, coming up there. I had met B.V. Karan earlier uh, because he'd come to do a Yakshakan performance with Shiv Ram Karan when I was a student at the NST. Uh, he was quite a taciturn, loner. I didn't have any equation with him. He was very, very aloof. So to find that I was going to be work and I, but I knew that he was a man of great uh, talent and uh, his stories were legendary. So I was quite excited that I'd be working with him. I was, I was allocated to the Rang Mandal. So I think there I had an opportunity which didn't in any way match at what position I was in life, completely hadn't done anything, but I had the opportunity to organize a workshop with Peter Brook, to meet Eugenia Barba, to meet all the great artists I've had in India, to meet writers, poets. It was a magical space to be in. And what I learned from there was, I think, indelible and imprinted in my psyche. It taught me that theater was hard. The theater was a journey. And there are many ways of doing a play because Rang Mandal, uh, you know, had, had many, uh, you know, Habib Saab came to do a play, Shekhna came to do a play. So it was open to calling people from the length and breadth of not only the country, but the world uh, to do a production, to do a workshop. So one dipped into all that. So when I came to Chandigarh, Karan Chi said one thing to me, whatever work you do, it must be local, it must be vernacular, it must be regional. The sensibilities must be regional, the, uh, uh, the moorings must be local, and the context must be from where you are positioned. So that became very significant uh, advice to me. And while we were in Rangmandal, I think it was a debate happening all over the country that we have to find tools of training the actor. Prior to that, most tools of training for the actor in drama schools were based on Western systems of training. Very foundational training processes. And I think I'm very grateful that I learned the Stanislavski system because all that I know about concentration, about magic if, about the attention, about units and objectives really come from my understanding of Stanislavski. But at that point, the winds of change were blowing. You know, there was Panikar in Kerala working with the Chakyars, and there was Ratantiyam in Manipur, and there was Habib Saab in Madhya Pradesh working with the Chhattisgarh folk artists. So in the same way, in Bharat Bhavan, we started having these interactive se sessions 
with what you would call the traditional um, uh, performance of Madhya Pradesh. And Madhya Pradesh is full of very, it has a very rich um, history of traditional performers, Rai Baredi, the Nacha tradition. So you would find actors of the Rangmandal who were selected through a very interesting workshop and process of selection, interact with these folk actors. The moment the beats would start, you would find the same actors who were so shy and so stiff and so self-conscious opening up and showing a kind of oomph and a rhythm that you never suspected their bodies had. So this became for me quite an eye-opener. And to now come forward to when I came to Chandigarh, when I'd heard stories of, you know, but, but, uh, you know, the, the Punjabi is not, the Sikh is not a lover, is not a hero. He was always the truck driver. I would like to reiterate here that this was in the 80s. And I thought to myself, I've heard such beautiful Punjabi spoken in my house. The entire Guru Granth Sahib is written in such high poetry, such wonderful. Yeah. In the same way, the Sufiana Kalam is all in Punjabi. So where did this image distortion take place? So I was very keen that whatever work I do would be in the Punjabi language with local actors using a regional sensibility, but I'm not a folk artist. I am a 20, 20th century or 21st century person. So my sensibility is certainly modern. And to me, the past didn't seem to be somewhere out there. It was a living tradition, capable of change, participating in the dynamics of change. So it became a very interesting combination, this working with rural and the urban actors, and that became my theatrical lead lead motive. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, that it actually sums up uh, your total approach to theater itself. And uh, anybody else to put in one or two questions more? Hello? Sir, am I audible? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, Ma'am, I have a small question. Uh, when designing a character, where do you draw the line between uh, having a caricature, like a commentary, and uh, realism? No, well, I think there is no drawing of lines. Because today, whenever we create a character, there's realism, there's stylization, there is uh, uh, imagination, there's metaphors, there's uh, uh, archetypes. You know, so many things collate together to create the character. There is no single way or single instructions that you give a character. Because it's like digging. You, the more you dig, the deeper you dig, many things get thrown out. How do all those things, uh, what is, what are those things that are thrown up and what are the choices that you make to pour them into the character that is being created? So I think it is, there is no template, there is no role model. There is just a sense of what looks right and what feels right which depends upon your experience, which depends upon your limitations, which depends upon how you see uh, playmaking at that point of time. When I look back at some of my earlier plays, I feel so distressed because it doesn't work for me. I don't know how I could allow that kind of acting to pass master because vocabularies change. Just like from the, from the postcard, we went to the uh, fax machine, we went to the teleprinter, now we are into emails. So nothing is fixed. Nothing is unmovable. Things change. And change is the process that we have to be alert to continuously. It is so easy to become dated. It is so, even if you do a classical play, you have to bring it to the now. Because everything happens now. What I'm speaking to you is now. It is not yesterday. So everything has to be put in the smithy of being tested at this moment. Right. What, like, very often my actress says, but ma'am, kal to aapne bohat tarif ki. You said ye bohat achcha tha. How come today you're dismissing it? 
when I'm doing the same thing. Because it worked yesterday. It didn't work today. Because between yesterday and today, something else has happened in terms of the way I'm looking at the production and looking at the actor. So the actor has to have that flexibility. Just like the director has to have the fle flexibility. These are relationships that are built up between the actor and the director. These relationships are very precious. The moment where 20 people get together or 10 people get together, at that time you become like one private ceremony that you are conducting. Maybe as soon as the play is over, everybody goes into their lives, everybody forgets each other. But for that point of time, there is a, there is a secret ceremony ritual of creating a world, a world of ideas, a world of emotions, a world of images, a world of feelings that you're creating between yourselves, a world wow. of trust. Okay. So is there a need for commentary on stage is my question. Commentary. Do we really have to uh, comment on a character, like create him as a caricature? Well, I think caricatures are only good in comedia or amongst, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, um, caricatures are an exaggeration and taking away from the real. If you do a whole production where you create a kind of style of caricature or you create a character, and there was a time I remember when Barry John in the Rang Mandal uh, did um, Kishtiyo Kado Savan, a servant of two masters. You know, people had big stomachs and they kind of waddled. That could be considered a caricature. It was very funny. It worked very well at that time. Uh, so it all, I don't think there is any hard and fast rule. There is nothing that, there is nothing that you can't do. You can do anything. If it works, fantastic. So everything, and the theater is not a place which is a rule book. It is a space where creativity flourishes, where creativity blooms. So everything is possible. Its potentiality is endless. I mean, when I first saw the work of Pina Bausch in uh, Delhi, I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, somebody puts an uh, um, uh, onion on her head and bashes it, hmm? and tears come down. Somebody empties a coffee, uh, a Nestle coffee powder on somebody's head. Dogs are walking up and down. Women are screaming for no rhyme or reason. I couldn't understand because this is going back somewhere late 80s, I think. I had no tools. I had no experience to understand that language of performance. Rejection would have been so simple because we all were comfortable by saying, Ay, kya tha? To aaya, and walk away. But to try and see that something was happening which I didn't comprehend. What is that limitation within my experience that prevents me from responding to something which I think is special? So you start reading, you start questioning, you start opening your mind. I think it's very important to have an open mind, to allow that openness, to allow different ideas, whether it's caricature, whether it is like breaks would say, where you comment on what is happening or the concept of the sutra And very often I have my actors do a role and then comment on what they have done. These are little devices that you evolve through the process of production. So everything is possible. Every, there is no, you don't need permission from anyone to tell you the creative license that you can exercise. It is yours. It is yours to fly. It's for yours. It's like that whole image of Paul Klee, you know, the angel, the Gabriel angel, who's poised to fly and something's holding her back. So don't let anything hold you back. Just fly. And it's better to fall than not to fly. Right. Better to make errors. Whether it's of a moment or of a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
may be the last question because we can keep on talking talking and talking and talking it's already 1:30 many people are hungry in india uh, i have a, a short question um i'm curious about uh, your methods when you looking for a, a play uh you have a, an idea of what you want to to express what you want to 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 talk about it or you find it in your in your journey i have you know no I mean? idea i have no idea i come now presently in the present way of working previously i had a text but in the present way of working i have no idea what i'm going to do and it's very unnerving for the actors you come on the stage and i uh, and you say uh, um, you know what is the starting point there's no starting point because you you're as empty they are there as recept receptacles to receive but you have nothing to start off with and you say okay what should we do let's talk about uh, what is it what are the things that concern you what are the things that are disturbing you what are the things that are making you happy let's try and articulate that through an exercise through an improvisation through an image through an installation then slowly we start taking baby steps taking uh, i'm sure even behind that blankness there is a method the method may not be visible to me at that point of time but there is a unconscious method that is at play that allows me the confidence to come in a space where there are 20 people looking at me expectantly to lead them and then saying i have no idea what i'm going to do that also i mean i've heard sometimes new actors that i work with are script to there's no script that we supposed to do and then i'll come back and say we are going to make the script we are going to do everything together make the script make the performance choose the objects choose the climaxes the beginning the middle and the end how it works and then you find that the actors like for example in gumhe to come back to my last play because that's freshest in my memory i uh, had many you know seven stages of grieving then there was something else and there was something else it's about a missing girl uh, so there were many pegs on which i was linking the story up and i said what do we do let's first of all map out the village in which the story is set who are the people what is what does the village look like let's draw out a map so i made one actor build a wall he builds a wall and he says that you know then he talks about Uh, there's a protest passing in my village because we've also talked about protest, and protest is also in this sex seven stages of grieving. That there's a protest going on. My uncle, my aunt, everybody is joining in the protest. Boy is building the wall, so he starts off with the fact that people in the village are protesting. Then he comes to the fact that there's a girl that's gone missing. Then he comes to the fact why building the wall, and. Uh, it's very difficult to actually articulate a play but so you have you draw out a map of the village who are the characters who's who's what is the mother doing how many houses the village has does it have that if you want to go if you want to go there's there's a school in the village but it's only till the second if you want to study further then you have to walk for 4 miles cross the river to catch a bus to go to the nearest town to go to school so somebody you're drawing out a graph so we find certain uh, certain moments um to ideating of how to start the moment and to come back to selislavsky when he says when we do things spontaneously we are searching for that moment but it is not but it is not the spontaneity that we are bringing on the stage but that moment that we have discovered through the spontaneity yeah, but, but i i want to know also before then you choose the play you have something in your mind that you want to talk about it or that you find it 
Well, I think they, they are, let's say they are undefined ideas. They are vague ideas. They, they are ideas. It could be about something about, you know, it depends what, 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 what as Bertolt Brecht said, you can't, you, you can't escape the prevailing winds that you are experiencing. The winds of change, the winds of uh, brutality, the winds of savagery. And within that, how do you find affirmation? How do you find hope? The very fact that you are talking about those issues shows that you've already started hoping that things will get better. So um, sometimes, you know, you're affected by whatever is happening in your country, whether it's about gender, whether it's about misogyny, whether it's about the, the problem of the homeless, whether it's about refugees. But let me also stop here and say that whatever work I do, I do not do it as an activist. I'm not a journalist. I'm doing it as an artist because this is the space in which I express all that is impacting my life. Sometimes it is not directly even related to the issues that are my concerns. It could be something that I'm fantasizing about, something I'm romanticizing about. Because fantasy and romance are also part of getting away from something which is too heavy for me to internalize, to deal with. So there are many, there are many, um, uh, there are many uh, levels on which one is functioning and operating and expressing. It's, okay. it's like uh, something singular, but it's plural, or you could say a multitude of singularities in that plurality. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So any, any last question or shall we wind up? You want to say something, Anand? Yeah, come on. So, Anand from uh, London, he's asking the last question. Hi, uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Neil Mom. Uh, hi. I heard you talking about uh, transformation of relationship between audience and actors, being the time you were in theater. And uh, I remember taking back in times, so, you know, my, the one of the theater piece of work that's been attracted me into theater was uh, King's Drum, Raja Chanda by Sabda Hashmi, where we were standing in proscenium and asking, throwing questions to the, uh, the, the audience. Where in time when I, I've watched a theater show in a lift where the, the, the boundary between the actors and the audience is really thin line. And I can see that it's shifting up and down where sometimes as an audience, like you know, as, as a viewer, I feel that I'm part of the theater. So we don't know where the line is actually drawn. So would you prepare your actors for the unexpected? Well, in the sense that, you know, I performed for Lyft three times. Uh, I did Yarma, I did Mad Woman of Sheyo, and I made a production for them for one of their Lyft inquiries. So I'm very familiar with the Lyft of the 90s. Um, I think this the line between the audience and the uh, actors has completely dissolved. The actors sometimes, uh, you know, uh, can invade the space. Whoever thought that they could invade the space that belonged to the audience and the audience could invade the space that belonged to uh, the actors. So those lines have completely dissolved. There is a promenade theater, there is site-specific theater, there's a theater where the actor actually comes and engages with the uh, audience or pulls the audience onto the stage. If there's no stage, they do it. I remember uh, when I was um, uh, performing one of my shows at Lyft, they wanted me to not do it inside. But at that time, I'd not, I was not prepared to do it outside because I had no experience of, I, I wasn't mature enough, you can say, as a theater person to be able to take that risk without feeling it might damage 
because it had been prepared for that kind of space. But now a lot of work we do, we start from the outside, we go inside, there's installation, you know, the, the, uh, the questions are thrown at the audience, the audience is sitting on the stage, the performance are performing in the center, the actors are performing in the center. So I think those lines have certainly dissolved. What is, what is theater? What was theater? All those boundaries have become so fluid. There are so many spillages that it has made the world of theater and the world of making a play so much more exciting. You know, you can start the play from the outside. You can uh, remove the seats. You can remove the wings. So anything is possible. So um, I think it's an exciting time because nobody is working on theoretical concepts. We read theories. We internalize them. And then we realize that the theories have given us the freedom to explore theater in ways that we never thought were earlier possible. Isn't there a danger in that? Basically, what I said, you as a director, you have a structure in mind and then an audience, audience then invading into your space and asking questions and would it no, actually... But, but I, I think the way you structure your play, they can only invade your space. If you've, if you've created within your play the possibility or the potential for it to be invaded. Oh. I remember seeing a play in uh, Lyft. Uh, it was called The Go-Go Girl, which was the life of a smoker. And her, she then went through psychoanalysis. And it was a father who actually put her on the streets. So she said, what do you do when the person who's supposed to protect you throws you to the wolves. Do you have any other choice but to become a street walker? And she was, it was a very interesting play because they actually start the play by, by objectifying all the different limbs of the woman, the breast, the genital area, the neck, the arm. Almost you felt like you were in a meat shop watching flesh being sold and it was a, a performance where she was nude so she would come and sit on the lap of an audience you know forcing us to say that it is society who puts us there and what is your how are you going to how are you going to absolve yourself from the responsibility if you're seeing the play take the responsibility that you are as much part of that cruelty that I have faced, part of the fact that my life has been destroyed because you are the ones who were the pillars of society. So I think, uh, uh, I think that the unexpected uh, invasion of space by the actor towards the audience in a certain way is also a awakening. I saw a play of, uh, I think it was Grotowski's play in Avignon. I was walking down, we were all waiting for the door, the bell to ring and the door to open. And uh, uh, we were told now you can enter the stage and so walk down a cobbled pathway. Suddenly one door opened out of, the, out of the wall and one woman came out, torn clothes, you know, hair ast uh, astray, men pulling her inside. It seemed like a gang rape. Before you knew, all the people in the audience, you know, the men especially, they threw their tuxedos and um, uh, ran towards her to protect her. But it was actually part of the performance. It was trying to tell the, uh, uh, the audience, don't be silent when there is something, when there's injustice happening before you. So it became... I'm not explaining it in too much detail because I can see that everybody's exhausted and we're running out of time and I must have lost 90% of the audience because it's been two hours. But what I'm trying to say is that it made you recognize that you don't come to see a play. You, it's like I remember reading a long time ago, we go to see a play like Antigone. Every member of the audience weeps for Antigone and is aligned with Antigone. But when they go home, they're all creons. <laughs> so 
how does how we are finding ways that theater should also be an instrument of change how does it impact you you explore different ways of how it can transform you into being something else so this exercise, this play that i saw in avenue where we all felt that the girl was actually being raped and we felt the need to roll up our sleeves and save her was in some way a very strong indictment on the silence of society that sees injustice and doesn't do anything so uh, i think uh, we have to stop somewhere maybe uh, there be people with other questions uh, but it's already 1:25 uh, so i have to just thank you all uh, for being with us and there's a lot of comments uh, in the chat box uh, commenting about uh, this session people say it's very insightful energetic energetic is the one word that gets repeated uh, refreshing resourceful informative and uh, so so many people are uh, writing the comment i'm just passing it out uh, to nilila mansing ji that people uh, simply loud uh, you hearing just it's very similar to what you are play that high energy that passion that is being uh, transformed uh, so thanks from everybody to you nilam ji and uh, uh so as i said at the beginning if anybody want allowed to get uh, the details about the next things you can type your whatsapp number or under your name so that there's a whatsapp group we'll let you know what's happening next week etc so the next sunday i along with deviga deviga bi hemant uh, will be talking on actor speech and voice we'll be doing that and the next sunday we'll have hs shiva prakash Uh, the Canada playwright uh, and uh, the retired professor from JNU speaking about Indian Shakespeare's. So, meet you next Sunday. And in between, uh, those people they are very new can introduce themselves in a minute, and uh, we can leave it like that. So, if somebody has uh, done it last week, somebody has done it in the beginning. so especially the new people we can just come in and say hi hello and uh, i am here i am so and so so that we will know each other a little more better hi can you hear me yes uh, i am jeda actually i am from dubai uh, uh, i am actually